Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two terrific poets with us today, Ed Friedman and Todd Colby. Ed will read first and then Todd. Ed Friedman is the author of 11 books of poetry and prose, including The Black Star Pilgrimage, Frontward Books, and the Telephone Book, Telephone Book slash Power Mad Press, and Humans Work, Helpful Book, as well as Mao and Matisse, Drive Through the Blue Cylinders, and Two Towns, all from Hanging Loose Press, La Frontera, Lingamats, Lingamats, and Ideal Boy are collaborations with visual artist Kim McConnell, The New York Hotline, and Away are collaborations with visual and performance artist Robert Kushner. From 1987 to 2003, Ed served as the artistic director for the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church in New York City, where he also edited the Project Literary Magazine, The World. Here's a wonderful, learned, generous poet, Ed Friedman. All right. Um, well, Harry, thanks so much for having me back. And Todd, it's great to be reading with you. <clears throat> we've known each other for a long time, but we've never done this. <laughs> and I'm very glad to be doing that. So I'm going to read from some poems that, at least in first draft, I wrote them um, between 2019 and uh, 2021. So they kind of straddle the uh, early part of the pandemic, but I don't really mention the pandemic. And their poems called Midsts, which is M-I-D-S-T-S. -S. So like, you, know, you say like you're in the midst. Well, what if you're in a lot of them? Well, that's what these poems are kind of like. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to probably just read straight through them. Uh, and... Um, it's not all of them, it's a selection of them. I wrote 104 of them over a couple of years and I don't know, I'm hitting about 40% eh, of them seem to still work and I'll give you a selection here. First one, Shimmer Crib. Call me connoisseur of Africa and anything good, dead, young, traditional that played there first. No, don't. How about 1960s Beirut nightclub maven? Nope. If only we were high tan mountain ranges. Under clear skies with nicknames. Big Swervy. Lowly Lizard Haven. Dusty Continuance. Let's meet the sea. Turn green. Deny our underlying identities. Never a devotee of stark wildness. I dream Nigerian juju music, King Sonny Ade, Chief Commander Ebenezer Obe, America's Queen Latifah, Jamaican Prince Farai, and Jammy. Give me word, main word, word up. What the stakes are in overdriven economies, lost starlight. I call you, hang up, call again when I'm in a better mood. You're not home. Out hunting? Massaging the neighbors? How what I know best can feel most fleeting of all. Seal briefing. Walk the beachfront in our little country. Meet its president. A kerchief covers her hairdo. Seaweed washes ashore, but none tangles the sandpiper's feet. Sporty old men, wrapped in green and white striped bath sheets, seek new public families, with or without children, who create parties, wipe sediment off drink coolers and picnic hampers. A sleeper, I wake up in shade, skin browned, not burned, in no need of central government. Sit nearby, clear of enveloping sentiment. Watch me stay dreamy. Assured, your eyes on the water and horizon return to me any time we agree on chilled pineapple spears.
I kid homo sapiens. Hand me a sleek new cardboard sign that blesses our pear grove's grand opening. What likely leads to strong grasping of tree-ripened fruit? Informed reach? We see against circumstances, darkening fall afternoon. Tree shadows swivel slowly. Close the sky blue Dodge Dart's door, wishing it were Chrysler's imperial model with strongly scented leather seats. Who thinks skinned animal upholstery rubs an average person for decades without memory or complaint? I do and don't. But now we waddle out, fuel up, go home, expect the world of poems, rehearse several happy faces, choose one, show it off to Dr. Alimentado's best-dressed chicken in the town, 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 the best to dress the chicken. Voluble Hints even the head of a pin needs its special cream. We call it sunlit ocean. No, cotton wish. Rub it on. Hesitate. Watch the day get roomy. My emotions unhurried follow this line home. Experience lagging, maybe in tight there. Don't smoke or depend on bees for buzz. You watched me recently take dainty bites to make myself hungrier, long for oceanfront, wear faded green shorts, remove their oily spots. One block away, Montana's most famous film director awaits our epic shooting script or jump off the table. Have you seen Sis's feverish writing method in action? Her ink dabs on sheets of cigarette paper Cease all control. Ample thingies. Come instantly awake today, feeling less safe. Wipe my hands. Look worried. Wipe my hands. Picture a million mountains. To imagine us there, how hard it is to find detailed motion in mental images that connect with each other, but remain rooted, not dead, but roped, having been a go once, now stopped. Water rises against shores or banks when among streams. An idea should rise, and when it doesn't, spend a dime. Hire somebody to wait like Jack Spicer the whole night for a radio signal. Visit the dry cleaners down the block and fish for believable compliments like, what a handsome wool suit you've got there, now that I've swabbed off all the schmutz. Vines sloughing to thwarts. I am the exact replica of 16th century Dutch life, unable to transfer know-how from printed woodcut to crop cultivation. Yet you are facts correlated to me, tides to my shoreline, amiable snowfall to plowed under barley stalks. We inquire about each other's hallucinatory dreams, their swirling, slightly metallic colors and herringbone patterns. Lori, my wife, paints those designs along with maddening paisleys. Animal fur motifs on live creatures enhance their survival odds, like cheetahs and sloth speeds, fast and slow respectively. Our sluggish drives at 20 miles per hour on busy throughways infuriate fellow motorists, winter or summer, crashes or not, about as much as marine life conservers get pissed off about tidal barrages. My idea of you arrives in Holland centuries early and dry. Thank you, Lowland Dykes. Chances. 
float away, blown behind sure, flat, hard dirt, says God. I notice her as the tour guide, recently escaped from flames, hunched shoulders, tailored dark blue suit jacket, no lapel badge engraved with deity. We're beyond beach road, desert shrubs, and scattered palms. They, these could talk, but don't. Am I partial to blonde hair neatly combed? Not at all. Who's a friend in this colony? Why arrive like tourists among flat-faced apartment buildings and two-story resort motels? God says, contain yourself. Don't exploit Mexico, pronounce Mexico, or don't stand apart when we most want unity. Talk first, or if in a dump truck, floor the accelerator. I am the god of matching outfits and deeply tanned forehead creases. You are state radio airwaves imparting the sublime for free. What we smell of each other drives us crazy. Umber pools. Slippery highball glass sweat. Cross the lobby to a motionless escalator that when it detects my weight, starts slowly downward, unzips life as on an enormous pair of virgin wool slacks, fleetless, economically speaking. We see the future with astonishing humps. Famous names goose us along. Alice and John Coltrane, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, Annie Leibovitz and Susan Sontag. Twin coal hoppers are a good option, as are sparkling upper range piano keys, trilling, struck late night, Pershing Lounge, Chicago, Ahmad Jamal. We see to motion, keep watch, attending really, unusual perfections of finish. Spidery blanks. Discussing track and field with my postal carrier, Chan Li, I confess deep love for pole vaulters who ready themselves by visualizing a plush river of stars dividing darker cosmic quarters, themselves in that flow. More momentum than speed, vaulters sail over the crossbar. Imaginations intact, hardly aware of what grounds them. Home ports, planet mass, parents. Chan concentrates to sort mail cleanly, intent and consequence. You don't learn anything from facts in order. Well, of course you do. What's loudest after all? Ocean waves breaking, church bell tolls, rocket liftoffs, garter straps snapping, rainfall and skylight glass. Here's a postcard for me with a Rancho Palos Verdes return address. Date time stamped September, I can't read the day, 1971, written in 11th century Japanese lady's hand. May's dogwoods bloom first in the palest possible green, then turn white. Sun-bleached hairs on bare-tanned manly arms, midsummer. On lonesome rampways. You look, you see serial numbers and two oil lamps. One with the base of an old world cow, his mother's favorite. Lady, the cow says, notice the fastest way out and take it. We stop off at home, the old world, ring the front doorbell, wait. Pretend we're sheet metal suppliers in a Japanese novel. Right, you look, you see, and no different. Fence, spotlight, remote control, sight and click. The garage door opens, bins and displays 
run passionately along the back wall, think someone's home, wish they are living meat and you're reading their vital signs, 40, 33, 37, an oppressed thin tan, an oppressed tan thin whale corduroy suit, button down powder blue Oxford cloth shirt, no tie, the coat's two vents keep its wearer on course. Beyond the wishing well are movie theater parking lots. We are known for them. The way everyone makes sense that falls apart briefly or long term. Try the back door buzzer again. Turn yellow sideways. The noise god, nose guard, loves to swim over the lake's natural bottom. Bologna and cream cheese rolls there guarantee her body wet insides. Science, always a surprise, surrounds the great inventor figurine mugs that my brother collects in exchange for chewing gum wrappers. Two especially spry mugs are Hedy Lamar and Alice Ball, whose bare-soaked feet or on a daybreak supply run. When we dry off, we get in bed hungry, squirm against each other, and wink away any blurring. What ancestors reveal through us is Dave's on the corner of Canal and Broadway, secret egg cream recipe, where knowledge, a fine spray really, spills, it gathers, rounds off our rockeries, Ice blue star juniper. I think they made Dave's some kind of sundry store at this point. My unstable Tomorrowland. It's summer, and the underappreciated Lake Huron stays unknown. Let's keep asking ourselves about futureless forms, play dress up. This difficult story goes wrong when it hits nighttime in the main yard. No telephone booths or dull green satin-like lawn. Turn towards me in an ironic exercise and say, sorry, honey, I thought we were the big winners, oiled and smooth. We pray at the shrine of the immense tub, utter native war cries on the 100 block of South Alta Vista Boulevard. Who belongs here, in European terms, stakes out the place, stops by the wobbly snack table for a blue cheese hors d'oeuvre. The underappreciated Lake Huron takes its name from the same language origin as your cheesy wedge. Francais, not Kanyan Kahaka. You see them? Blinking fireflies, blowing cigar ash, the swimming pools, underwater floodlights. Aren't fuels adorable? Why make up names for products? Slipper flow for an old hand painted city gardener's truck, or here among melons, or Fresno's fabled outskirts. Look down the sidewalk, almost ready to go, or 50 assured laborers waiting patiently to be hired, hardly patient compared to green mountains among proven revolutionary methods. Legged life forms crawl out of night blackened waters. Sharp corners require record amounts of chipping and sanding. Once, you could buy them, and like predicting noon, life maintained a presumed shape. Now, I cross a country road and point to myself, motion you towards me. We start minding the city's chill and observe incisive slogans, hand-lettered, fussed over, on strike and parade posters and especially on pictorial orange crate labels. Bonnie's Best, 
Wands Wonderland, Daring Mandarins. My flirty trances. Energy makes the world current. We people, all experts, stir the road dust, have our hairs fall out. The flat view, green sweeps, sand and scrub, muddy canals, forms horizons, stain golden this afternoon. Plenty to think about. Homo sapien sapiens. Our paths intersect and splay. We push on, stare calmly, camp and cook. Games transform every occasion into parties. Pickups slow down, stall outs continue. You probably know every time we touch each other, irritations mount, skins flush, sentiments shift. Oddly enough, for hours, weeks, lifetimes, Vibrant and dull meanings take hold. Elaborate cultures and unrecordable histories. One theory, yet unproven, is we dream all we know every night and could spend days exchanging knowledge with anybody we want. And that would be everyone. Slow cruise damper. Where I saw you before exactly is in Wang An Shi's Heaven's Loom of Origins Unfolding Tao Thought Experiment, David Hinton translation, an act with hurricanes force, only not that violent, requiring speed and fat. Now wait and make much of squat bronze lamps with empire shades, oyster patterned. Mmm, they feel good, worthy of time. Down a back hall, up the dark stairwell, my daily pills are laid out in seven labeled opaque plastic compartments. Snap open Monday. Nothing here for pain, pleasure, or hallucinations. Swallow these tablets for raised potential. More moonlit stream currents gather and disperse all night. So that's the end of my reading. <laughs> I guess I was reading them slower, but being here with you, a little adrenaline pushed them along faster. But I sort of wanted to run a little short, Harry, because I remember from last time you liked to chat with the poets a little bit. So I thought I would leave us a little room. Well, I just love the way you lay down the images in such a precise and constant way and develop this procession. You mentioned Jack Spicer. It's also, uh, you know, somewhat like Gary Snyder's poem, Rip Rap, laying down those rocks that he walks on. And this is a way of life that you have given us. It, you know, you include history, you include culture, you are not egotistical, you have a narrative built by the, the images, you know, as Ad, El, Edward Dahlberg said, you know, one image emerging out of the other. And they're just so, um, I don't know what it is. It's just there, the way you did this is just so co constant. It's, it's compelling and eerie. And yet at the same time, there's so much confidence in the way you, you, you created this. Uh, you know, how do you, how did you, uh, give yourself, do you have any limitations or do you have any visions of what you're going to do or you just lay down the images? Uh, could you just give us uh, a way of uh, perceiving this in terms of the way you uh, put this down or did they just come out and then you edit it? Do you refine it all? It's just so, uh, you know, so pleasurable to hear. And, uh, you know, it's just so soothing too. Um. Well, this this series, uh, I um, I took the one thousand most commonly used words in the English language, wow. and I randomized them, <laughs> and I sort of I set myself the goal of, you know, using I would take fifteen at a time, right. and so you know, 
the idea was that I, rather than give myself a complicated vocabulary to work from, I gave myself a simple one that would keep cueing me back towards, you know, towards everyday speech and talking. Um, so, uh, with, you know, I also keep, you know, notes in stuff that I read and things like that. And those, those come into it too. And then I, I ran these in, I sort of set an idea that I would shoot for 14 lines, not because I wanted to make sonnets, but, you know, with 14 lines, you have to think about, at a certain point, you have to start thinking about the end of it. And um, that sort of means that sometime, somebody else mentioned this too, like around seven or line seven or eight, um, you have to know something different about what you're doing to get out of it. <laughs> basically and um so th that was you know the main thing uh those were the main constraints that i had and sometimes and so when i go to edit and i i do a fair amount of editing um it is to get precision um it is to you know notice places where it goes flat and i can you know strike lines and sometimes i wrote 16 and ended up with 13 and um <laughs> i always keep remembering uh this interview with uh you know randy newman on the today show and and they put him in front of a piano and <laughs> poor guy they they asked him well would you compose something for us and he said no nah, i don't think i'm going to do that he said well what would you be thinking right now if you were sitting in front of your own piano and he said I was thinking about, you know, when I could leave. <laughs> it's a little bit like that, you know, sometimes with these poems is that I get to certain points and I run out. And that's always where I think they get more interesting, like, okay, what are you going to do here? And I just like throw something at it, you know, and in about over half of the poems, those things that I throw at it don't work. You know, but that's why you write over a hundred of them so you can get a number of them that do. And that's about all I can say about my method for these. You just did a fabulous job. I just, I love it. Uh, you know, you were the, uh, as it said in your bio, you know, you were the artistic director at St. Mark's Church for the Poetry Project. If a young poet comes to, or young, old, any age, comes to New York City, what would you suggest to him or her places to go for poetry? When I was in New York City, the first place I went to was St. Mark's Church on the Bowery in 1966. So could you just take a minute and just tell what you would suggest if a young, you know, if a poet comes to New York City and looking for a place to read or and listen to great poetry? Well, you know, it's, it's all a little bit different now after three years of pandemic. Um, you know, I'm currently um, working um, with another poet friend, Bob Rosenthal, on a series. We're doing about eight readings at the Bowery Poetry Club called New York Poets. You know, so I think the readings, you, I think, you know, when you're young, and I have a 24-year-old son, and I can bear this out because I can't quite remember what I was like at 24, you know, do everything. You know, there used to be a New York City poetry calendar, you know, and so you could, you know, any night of the week have your choice of 10 readings. That may exist or something like that now, but now you sort of go on to social media and you look at, you know, where poetry is being read online and in person. And I think you you run and you do everything. And there are still writing workshops at the Poetry Project. You know, there's still reading series there. But there's there's lots else going on. I think that I would say the New York and Poets Cafe, although they're closed for the moment, they're physically remodeling. But the slams, at least, are taking place at the Bowery Poetry Club on Monday nights. So there's there's still lots to do in New York. The 92nd Street Y will have some readings. There's there's lots, but I think it's it's all still kind of starting up in person again. Well. Oh. Well, thank you very much. I, I want to also uh, congratulate you for or praise you for all the great work you did, not only with your own wonderful poetry, but for others, your literary camaraderie and 
you know, I love St. Mark's Church. To me, that's always been the number one place to read poetry in America. So I just am so thankful to everybody who worked there. You know, when I was there, Paul Blackburn and um, among others were there. So thank you very much for your wonderful reading, Ed Friedman. And our next poet is Todd Colby. Todd Colby is a poet and visual artist. Colby is the author of six books of poetry. His most recent chapbook, It's Okay to See Ghosts Now, was published by Spiral Editions in 2023. His writing and art have recently appeared in Iterant, if I pronounce that right, The Believer, Bomb Magazine, The Brooklyn Rail, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, and Poetry Magazine. Here's a marvelous, delightful poet, Todd Colby. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to start off first by saying um, how, um, how important Ed was to my beginnings as a young poet when I came to the Poetry Project uh, from the fields of Iowa. Um, and it was in 1988 that I, Richard Hell gave me my first reading at the Poetry Project. And then Ed subsequently gave me opportunities to teach workshops and to do the win, curate the Wednesday Night Series program. Um, and then I was served on the board for 10 years. So it became because of Ed's pushing and opportunities that he provided me with over the years. He, um, uh, you know. I, I, now I have half my life involved with the poetry project. So thank you, Ed, for that, for giving me that step up. Um, <clears throat> the first poem I'm going to read is called uh, The Silver Room. So here are your bones, but there won't be anyone left to tend to them. They'll just sit there and turn to dust and get all over our books. One must do the song and dance of the living machine in a valley of metal objects. I have seen the future, and it is full of awkward feelings. The forester told a group of hikers that they shouldn't participate in any untoward behavior along the trail because their hike would be recorded by a series of trail cams. Under a microscope, the surface of a CD is a map, a scale map of a room, a silver facsimile of a room. Certain large garbage containers make a gong sound when they are struck with a frozen bird of some sort. Is this where we need to go again to the past? Who doesn't pretend to forget their faults in the summer of glimmer as we raise our collars and broaden our scope? An evening of square dance and alcohol seizures were all we had. They pick us one by one to survive their way. They were of the painters of landscapes and figures depicting what was right there all along. They were of cystic last words flaunting their appeal with slogans on banners and blasted reckonings. They were the variety who shot a swallow from a hotel window, a splash of dogs to my side. They sound like humans pretending to bark like dogs. Bright yellow daisies leap up out of the dark green shit show, was disconnected, was unraveled, was terminated, was unspoken, was remote, was unharmed, was delayed by high winds, was standing in the yard, giving us a hard time. Maple tables hours, maple tables hours, maple tables hours. During our summer, they did their job all through the weather changes, all through the new plans and all through the misdirection schemes. The path led to blue sparks that brought migraines from the high pressure system. Does the weather do you better than now? B does bitter weather too? Let it sink in. It matters that your arm lifts and waves in my direction, from rank insurance ga gaffes to city regression schemes, Cooper Union downtime. What a little black mold will do to your breathing. It is 50 steps to the piano from here. How old is the wavy glass in the window that looks out on nothing much from the place you know? Pop quiz. Does the dream never end? Answer. The dream hasn't even begun yet. Now, please don't release agency as this is well toured. What a definite break would do from skin to sky is release your entrails into the Earth's orbit. Everyone is misreading you. Prominent devices at 60 tons do whatever it is. So it feels pretty tight. Yes, tight. Yes, I said tight. 
At night, there's a fond chemical in the chamber in your heart, and it wreaks havoc again and again. There are nights, and then there are more nights, and nights after those nights, and nights again and again. There are the nights between nights, and there is each night, and all the nights, and just those nights. In the movie of your life, the actor playing you will fret over books on a long maple tabletop. It's ours, this table. This maple table is ours. A ton of placement can't wait on the piano player and then directly address the crowd while singing Shitstorm 2000. What is a song that sounds like a meadow? What is the cascade of calm from this tiny vial? What do they see when they look at what you made? The marble columns surrounding the sleepy hall are covered with lime graffiti, a painted overlay about the darker greenery. A bright orange volleyball pops up to the top of the safety net and falls back onto the sand court to cheers, wild cheers. I can make a Space Invader doll from a Sprite bottle. I can get a spaced out look during our little talk. I can weep oddly along the bike path. I can baffle a neighbor with a little soft shoe on the porch. It is still early spring, not summer, early, but late in the world. Take a class to learn what's right. Take a class to understand more about what is a burden to you. Kick where it hurts, but only where it hurts. Again and again, how to write a pilot does not compute. What is in your bag does not concern me. A cackle of laughter like a crack from a whip. A wet towel slaps against the water. Whack, whack, and an alligator appears. You know that show where all the character does is sit there and pet something? That type of show where a dad is working, but not like a dad or a job. How much does a day take out of you? I was thinking about how much I should charge for what it removes. You know, do whatever you want as long as you're selling something. I've never been less clear-headed about a century than I am right now. I don't know what they call what we do, but there is always a soft way. You can smell it around them. Okay, shave the side of your head down to the skin on one side, from the top of the ear to the middle of the top of your skull. Now, grow the other side longer. Let it grow as long as it can get and then cut it with garden shears on one side. And good luck with all of that from this point forward. Yeah, I can't think in terms of approximations, not at this point. What we can do is your end is, is what we can do to your end of the deal is watch Dennis Hopper explaining fractions in Apocalypse Now. What can anyone do in this life that doesn't include the lower half? I'm not sure about before September, not after summer, not before the new year, not after Christmas, not in the forest. Not on the beach, not in the mountains, not in a desert by the factory, not in the prickly aftermath of a series of blunders, not even in the cool, calm, cushioned advancement of horror. All your contacts will know you have a killer pad. You can taste something real and homespun in these sandwiches. You have ground a canine tooth into something remarkably creepy and edible. Don't let me stop you from asking for an upgrade. The mischief inherent in vice is not to be navigated in threes. I demand air. I saw you force my hand into a bright bucket of cuttlefish. I think I heard you say, not on my dime. Yeah, service comes with it. Yeah, it doesn't get rained out. Yeah, they do a lot of ab work. Yeah, there will be an executive lounge. Glass shattered on the lot and set us searching on all fours for maximum bad shit that can happen in a day. They just called and said there's an allotment and we've reached it. The maximum amount of bad shit has been reached. I give this echo to the valley. I don't know. Yeah. I think they've talked about it. I think they've made their case, but I don't know. It would be something if you saw the postcard arrive on the truck when it came for you. If you were laughing at the postcard and swaying as you looked down at it, late afternoon light flickering on your shoulder. <clears throat> this is called Serious Question. Do people in modern times get punished for fighting for the dead? 
The head controls the body in the case of being physical, the acrid matte tang of toner on paper. Who knew that the eighth grade lunchroom was the roadmap for life? The freak with the green umbrella is Ajax. You could not have played this any better than you did. Frightening is now synonymous with perfect. The cure was bird shows and Xanax. A whistle, a horn from a car, a light breeze from the humming fan. The beautiful moment when I imagined my head weighing almost nothing and lifting my body up. I was just remembering how you used to say, if it's not one thing, it's another. And I never knew what you meant. But now I do. <clears throat> this is called a, this is a test. And it goes a little something like this. You might have forgotten something. Perhaps you forgot something. Life makes things impossible. Everything is unbearable. It is good when things fail. Everything is working. The day is bright and brooding. The day is angular and sharp. The day is completely messed up. It is harsh and irregular. There must be something beautiful here. People flip birds at you. People ask you to deliver things to their homes, and then they flip birds at you. Birds flutter from their hands. You follow the rules governing chaos. You adhere to the rules governing civil behavior. People follow rules all the time, but it doesn't matter. Someone has to follow the rules, but it doesn't matter. I can see everything clearly now. Everything is clear. What I see is everything is here, and it's clear. My fingers are shriveled from soaking in the light. My fingers are shriveled. My fingers are soaking in the light. Can you see where I'm waiting for you in a room? I'm waiting for you in a room. I assume you understand where I am. <clears throat> People will still love. A certain sense of civility matched the day perfect. I was most funny when I wasn't trying to be. Sometimes I think I'm dying, and I am. 143 likes. Deep inside the sold-out day, people are trying to find satisfaction and maintain their wonder. In many cases, I don't know anything. Meanwhile, a heat dome is the beginning of the end of something good. The air conditioner sounds like a vinyl version of metal machine music. Caving in is better than being above reproach. The darkest, saddest, hottest summer is halfway over. The sun dips behind the high line at a new angle. More coffee never solved anything. The corpse flower blooms once every nine years. Free sunlight, free water, fresh orange paint on the side of that monstrous building. <clears throat> this is called Nothing is Delayed. Raise your hand if you have ESP. Start with yellow as a source of light. I have a little crush on your bullshit. The slow sparks of a quiet Saturday fueled by protein bars and caution tape. The rose stencil, joggers. If this hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened. And so, a day uncoils and the spring vessel goes haywire in the sun. Humming a melody as I walk home so slowly that people ask if I need help. Tell me. What goes on in cramped submarines? Thanks for not toning it down. Thanks for trying really hard not to be a big jerk. Thanks for finally admitting I'm a pretty good dancer. Thanks for not making me feel more ridiculous than I already do. Thanks for suggesting that I improve my sleep hygiene. 
Thanks for not jumping on the Tide Pod eating bandwagon. Thanks for not making me feel nervous anymore. Thanks for working on your tone. Thanks for reminding me how unnecessary I am to your happiness. Thanks for reading Emily Dickinson to me over the intercom at Price Chopper. Thanks for featuring me as a sailor in your dream last night. Thanks for telling me you hope I don't get hurt in a kayaking accident. Thanks for not getting that spaced out look during our little talk. Thanks for reminding me I can't undo anything. Thanks for asking me to sing just a bit more. Thanks for reminding me that everything feels a little off right now. Thanks for telling me that there's something fucked up about squirrels. Thanks for reminding me that there's a lot of relaxation podcasts available. Thanks for reminding me there are still a lot of good people. Thanks for doing things I do not understand. Thanks for reminding me there's something wrong with a lot of people. Thanks for telling me that even the pigeons are behaving oddly. Thanks for finding constructive ways to be angry. Thanks for reminding me about impermanence. Thanks for reminding me about the dangers of ticks. Thanks again for trying to be kind through all this. Thanks for not scaring me when I came home last night. Thanks again for watching me dance and saying, wow. <clears throat> I only have a hundred more poems. And this one is called Lead Singer. The music of my youth formed along the banks of the Des Moines River, where old men caught catfish and I was the annoying kid playing punk songs on a ukulele. The symbolic edge to every pop song is not just for my entertainment, I presume. It's all a mystery, what they do with their time. The songs do have a purpose, like an elevator has a purpose or a truck falling things has a purpose. So many beautiful brains that made our best known tunes are just mushy masses underground now. The fingernails, the hair, a screen door gently closes. No one gets mad about the metallic smell of autumn. The area around my life is lit by the area around my light blue autumn trousers. I did drop in with a cape and a coral group. When it's hot, I don't notice the weather as much. A century could go by and there would be no telling how long it took someone to become remarkable. A life will always be different once you conclude it's difficult to look back and see the lack of logic in anything that happened at all. They call us meat-coated skeletons. Suddenly we're going to be down to zero soon. Bang your fist in time to the deep end countdown. Who curates all these out-of-control feelings? <laughs> We've grown so fond of being in one place at a time with this new, throbbing pressure. A return to chaos where the senses add order. A can of oxygen for her migraines. Thinking of places I can tell people about the disorienting effects of laying down and looking up. I felt faint after I climbed the tower. I loved the pomegranate detail on the place setting. <clears throat> and this is my last poem. And it's called Medical Massage. Morning flashes into the room like a fork stuck inside an electric outlet. If the day is full of people who've discovered distraction, then I am in the right era. Laughter is impossible only when you're underwater. Things will get put on you that you can't rub off with a towel. I can't stop collapsing, but I can do something that will seem like a relatively safe alternative. Clean my teeth, for instance, or walk around singing something not even under my breath, but blaring. 
Hold on to the bus and get to know what the air does to your figure in a landscape. I might be observed as an astronaut is observed while training to go away. But that's just one way to move through time without getting up or sweating. The web a spider makes succeeds at being a sticky pattern. I am everything but refined. I dance foreverish. I tighten my belt, and I don't even wear a belt. Thank you. Wow, what a compelling, vibrant, explosive, <laughs> human, imaginative reading. You know, just amazing. You know, that you're just, so, it's so arresting. You know, you just, uh, and the humor that you have in there. And could you just take one of your poems and just talk about it? I mean, it's just, you're really explosive. And it just, uh, mm-hmm. it's so connected to us all, you know, the way you let everything out. And yet it's so, con- you have such strength of narrative. It's so compelling. Could you just mm-hmm. tell us one poem about how you may write one of your poems? Yeah, um, um, Silver Room, the, the poem that I opened up with, um, was written sort of at the height of the pandemic. And I keep these big black sketchbooks that I just write down phrases and thoughts and much like many other poets I know. Um, and then from that comes the sort of assemblage of from those uh, various phrases and terms. And I found some sort of through line that happened in it. Um, and it, sometimes I feel like the words sort of animate me in a way that I don't like I'll look back at this tape. If I watch this, I won't realize I'm doing all this stuff and and all that. So I I kind I kind of like getting to a point where the the language and the breath sort of inhabits me and I inhabit it. And then I don't know, time stops and I just feel good doing it. So I yeah, and I, I don't know if that helped, but that's the poem. Well, uh, you mentioned you know one line that I really loved among many: the annoying kid playing punk songs on my ukulele. You know. <laughs> Uh, where did you grow up and when did you write your first poem? Oh, that's a good question. I was born in Austin, Minnesota. Um, and then my dad worked for Hormel, the meatpacking company. And we moved to Atlanta where he, he was transferred. And then we moved to Tumwa, Iowa when I was in junior high. So around seventh grade, I lived there through college. Um, and there, the Des Moines River runs through Tumwa, Iowa. It's in southeast Iowa, very depressed, kind of sad town. But um it's where I first discovered so many great poets from the, from the Tumwa Public Library and um, would just sit by the river and read. Um, I never really played ukulele, but it was a nice enough image. <laughs> but I would sit there and read, you know, the lyrics of Bob Dylan. I was reading, I don't know, Rimbo. I was, everyone was just uh, filling my head with so much. It yeah. sounds very pastoral, you know, sitting by the river reading. And yet you got all these like you know, explosive things and you just let it all out. You know, who are some of the poets i i kind of have a feeling who I, you might have but who are some of the poets that influenced you before you started reading in a or before you started writing in a regular serious way oh you know what there was um 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 there was a uh, anthology of poetry that i found when i was in 7th grade called poetry of relevance and it would take sort of lyrics by um i don't know, a, a popular singer and compare it with another poem and um, so I, I, I remember that very well. And then there was a woman named Lynn Lifshin. You remember her? She was in the back of the New York. Or she, they always put her poems in the back of the Rolling Stone. So as a kid, when I was in junior high, I would be reading about Aerosmith or whatever, television, whatever I was into. But there was always these little tiny poems in the back. And I thought they were just so precise and so, um, I don't know, delicate and, and meaty at the same time. So that was another one. I mean, there's a list a mile long behind me and all around me, but I would say those are the, yeah, the, the earlier ones. Well, Lynn Lifshin, I remember she was prolific, wasn't she? She just had hundreds and hundreds of poems. She just turned them out. Ed, why don't you come on the show with us? You know, click on, click off your video or click on your video and we'll talk together. Why don't uh, each one of you, starting with Ed first about Todd and then Todd about Ed, just say something, uh, if you like, about the other's uh, poetry today. It's just really, you know, such a vibrant. I know you're New York City and, you know, it just feels like New York City coming to Southern California and just really stirring up, getting us all excited. So, Ed? Well, I will say that, that you know, something that, that 
stays true about your your from your roots you know as much as i remember them is that you were you know the lead singer you know for a punk band and you were also you know performing in slams and so there was um there was a kind of energy where you kind of like grab the audience and say <laughs> It's my turn, and you're going to lose. <laughs> and you always, you know, always did that in a really, you know, fun and humorous way. Um, but it was a certain kind of poet's oh, survival in that the scene as it existed at that point. And um, do you? I know I I sang in bands too, like in my in my twenties, but you know I didn't exactly hark back to them. But I can still hear it, you know, in in your writing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, you know, yeah. If, if I may interject one thing before Todd talks about Ed's poetry, my son Dylan, you know, he was a beach kid, and then he got into punk when he was nine years old, and so. Uh, you know, I remember it, taking him to his first punk concert and he got out of the car. He was about 12 and he turned around and looked at me and says, I'm so excited. I can't stop laughing. You know, he's just <laughs> so excited to go to one of those. But go ahead, uh, Todd, about your what you would like to say to Ed about his poetry today. Well, I've always admired what, what Ed does is he's just he has this economy of language that's um, like it's, it's like a like a, a well-made dish a food dish or something where just the perfect ingredients are thrown in. And, and he couldn't hear me when he was reading, but there's certain lines he was saying that I was laughing out loud and thinking, Oh my God. And just say, he says it with such a deadpan way. So I always hear his voice when I read his work. And there's just a, I think there's just a, 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 a beautiful clarity and a, and a beautiful attention to phrases and things that we hear every day that he's sort of, Matt put some magic dust in and makes me listen to the world and watch the world differently, which is, I think the best compliment I can give a fellow poet is like somebody who, who makes life more interesting after I hear him read or her read or they read. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I feel about it. And also without an artificial narrative too, he just lays those down, you yeah. know, such a, makes it look so easy too. I know he works at it, but, and well, you two are just marvelous poets and, I, mean, I just love this reading today. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I would, um, what would you like to say, uh, Todd? Just, uh, we have about a minute left about what, um, what, what's important to you for, like, what would you say to a young poet who's just beginning to write? You know, what would you say to a young woman who sitting down to write her first poem? What would you suggest her to focus on? Well, I, I like sort of like what Ed said, just do it all. But I feel like not setting up limitations or lines of demarcation between acting, between poetry, between punk rock, between painting, between dancing. And I think the more that those sort of membranes are sort of pierced, and I think there's more freedom in the work. It's what, I, you know, I thrived on at the Poetry Project. There's so many poets from John Giorno to Jim Carroll to Patti Smith to, you know, whatever. <laughs> There's a million, like, opportunities and ideas that I feel lucky for to, to be of this generation that I got to grow up under, those sort of voices. So I did just think, like, just, yeah, do it all, but do it all with a sense of bravery and joy and commitment, and, and things will happen. <laughs> Well, you both have done that, and I deeply appreciate you coming on the show today. I have to, not that I have to, but I want to uh, tell us all what's coming up next Tuesday. We have two wonderful poets, Sarah McClay, who teaches at Loyola, and uh, Celeste Goyer, and they're both terrific poets, and they're going to read from their new books. So that's that, and here's our wonderful director, Jennifer Clymer. Can we just say thank you, Harry? Thanks, thanks yeah. so much for having us. You're Thank such a you. great host. Uh, our pleasure. <laughs> Harry does such a beautiful job week after week, putting together the perfect people for the show and guiding this wonderful hour. Thank you, Harry. Thank you for the opportunity, Jennifer. Of course. <laughs> All right. Hopefully we see you guys back here soon. Yeah, sure. In the meantime, give our regards to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>